It all started with Dark Town Strutter's Ball. It was 1956, and my sister was about 14. She and a couple of girlfriends got the idea to learn the Charleston for an upcoming Roaring Twenties dance. Much to my mother's disapproval, they showed up at our house with records and cranked up the Victrola in the living room. Mama flashed her usual warning look, but my sister ignored her and pushed back a couple of chairs to make room. I hung on the sidelines, eager to join in, but with one ear cocked toward the back of the house where Daddy was reading a Raymond Chandler mystery. Ma made it clear from a, to us from an early age that once Daddy entered the sanctuary of his home, as he liked to call it, he wanted things orderly, quiet, and calm. She was as meticulous as a general in planning our evenings so that dinner was on the table at six on the dot. My sister and I were seated beside her with quiet voices and company manners. And the house was still as a tomb the rest of the evening so my father could read in peace. Then, Dark Town Strutter's Ball started and Sharon, Loretta, and Myrna began to dance. Myrna was the bossiest of the trio, and since she'd been taking tap dance lessons at the Moose Hall for as long as we could remember, she was the natural leader. At Mom's insistence, the music was playing at the lowest possible volume, but it wasn't long before Sharon turned it up a notch. I was drafted as Loretta's partner, and Pepper, our fox terrier, who went everywhere I went, frolicked beside us. Mama, who loved music of any kind, soon joined us in the living room, dish towel still in hand, tapping her foot and offering suggestions. In an old photo album in our living room, there was a series of pictures of a much younger version of our father, holding an enormous trophy, playing tennis, a group shot with the debate team, and my favorite, Daddy doing the Charleston. <laughs> Arms flung out, legs askew, a look of pure joy on his face. My sister and I would look at those old photographs with a sense of awe. This was a part of our father's life that we knew nothing about. The photos we had on the shelf reflected the dignified man who went off with a briefcase every morning to teach eighth grade in a rural school about an hour away. He came home in the evenings, changed into slippers and a cardigan sweater, and retired to his study to read or correct papers emerging long enough to eat supper and help us with our homework. We'd see glimpses of the younger daddy from time to time. Sometimes, without warning, he would burst into verse. He'd walk back on his heels, close his eyes, and recite a snatch of lines from Shakespeare or Tennyson or one of his other favorites. Other times, he'd stop in his reading to point out an interesting word or turn of phrase it might be snappy repartee from one of his detective novels or a lyrical line from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He loved to read. Words excited him. And he shared them with anyone within earshot. Listen to this, he would say, lowering his book and looking over the top of his glasses. And we would listen raptly, glad to be included in his private world of words and books. But the young, carefree man dancing with such abandon in the photograph might as well have been somebody else. Mama's brother Jack, for instance, who laughed easily, joked around with Mama, and sometimes spun Sharon and me around the living room to one of the tunes on the radio. Uncle Jack's good humor was something we could count on. With Daddy, it was fleeting. He could be smiling and laughing one minute, and the next thing we knew, Something would rub him the wrong way, and he'd blow like a geyser. His temper got him in trouble at school, too, but he was a gifted teacher, and his students loved him. So the principal and other teachers chalked up his outbursts to the artistic temperament. <laughs> Thanks to Mama's diligence, we didn't limp Sandy's temper often. When we'd giggle uncontrollably or shove each other too vigorously while doing homework at the kitchen table, a stern look from Mama with a glance toward Daddy's closed door would usually get us to quiet right down. <laughs> if things got out of hand, Daddy would come out and intervene. Sometimes he'd put his hands on our shoulders and give us a fathery lecture about the importance of getting along. Or he might try a teacherly approach. 
Here now, what's the problem? <laughs> Other times he'd shout, quiet, from behind his closed door, or worse, come out and glower at us until we settled down. He walked back to his den, shaking his head and muttering, can't a man have any peace? <laughs> Usually, that would be the end of it. But if he'd had a bad day, our actions would be the straw that broke the camel's back. When that happened, he'd storm out of the den, scoop his keys off the kitchen counter, grab his hat off the hook by the door, and head for the Atlas Star down on Main Street. <laughs> Daddy had been sober since I came along, but back when he was drinking, a trip to the Atlas could mean he'd be gone for days. I guess Mama was still holding her breath. Even though he came back in an hour or so with his temper in check, Mama would sniff the air for a scent of whiskey and scan his eyes for signs that he was off the wagon. Certain our bad behavior had driven him to drink. We didn't mind the trips to the Atlas because it meant we could listen to the music we liked, laugh as, long, as, laugh as often and as loudly as we wanted, bicker over the usual things sisters quarreled about, and run around the house with pepper nipping at our heels. <coughs> Most of the time, our evenings were dull and quiet. Our sibling rivalry, con our sibling rivalry confined to whispered battles behind the closed door of our shared room. So that night, in our glee, we must have forgotten about Daddy, <laughs> reading in the back room. There we were, all of us whirling around, doing our own interpretation of the Charleston, suddenly our father appeared out of nowhere and stood in the living room doorway. We stopped in our tracks and held our breath. Daddy walked over to my sister, took her by the hand, and started dancing. <laughs> it was a sight to behold. His feet moved like they were disembodied, keeping time perfectly, never missing a beat. Our portly father was as graceful as Fred Astaire as he nimbly executed the steps, spun around, bowed to my sister, and then asked my mother to put down her dish towel and take a spin around the room. I recognized the look on his face. It was the same one as the one on the young man in the photographs. Blissful, ecstatic, pure joy. Mm -hmm.